Hello everyone. Um, I'm Boris Brazil and I'm working for Freelectron for almost four years now. Um, as part of my job for Freelectron, I'm actually doing a lot of stuff around uh, ARM SOCs. And one of these drivers I have developed for uh, Marvel SOC is the crypto engine driver, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so let's see what we'll see. Uh, during this talk. Uh, first, I'll try to introduce various uh, cryptographic concepts. So this will be a short introduction to those concepts, and, and I don't pretend to be uh, explaining everything about cryptography here. Uh, then I'll try to explain uh, what kind of services the, the crypto, the internal crypto API provides, so how you can uh, use those services and after that, we'll uh, dig a bit in, into the uh, crypto API to develop a uh, crypto engine driver. <coughs> and finally, I'd like to share uh, my experience, the experience I had while developing the, the Marvel's uh, crypto engine driver. So let's start with the uh, basic concepts. Um, of course, if you already heard about Alice and Bob, I guess you don't need this introduction, but uh, for those who would, would know, know these people, then uh, I'll try to sum up a bit what crypto cryptography is about. So uh, cryptography is about uh, ensuring that a communication with uh, two people or more than two people is uh, uh, protected. Uh, and this protection is actually uh, separated in, in three main concepts. So the first one is confi uh, confidentiality, which means that uh, no one else uh, can spy on the, the communication which is happening with between those people. Uh, the second one is data in integrity, which means uh, no one else is supposed to uh, modify the content of the communication, or at least if someone modifies the content, then all the people uh, can notice and decide to uh, close the, the channel. And the last one is uh, making sure that when someone sends you a message, this message is actually coming from this person and not from someone else. Um, why? Uh, how do do we do that? Uh, it's basically we're just manipulating uh, input and output data and adding some metadata to it, and then thanks to that we can uh, ensure those three uh, things. So uh, the first thing we'll see in cryptography is the. Uh, cryptographic hash, or what is called sometimes digest. And this is the part which is supposed to uh, guarantee the uh, integrity of, of your data. So hashing functions basically uh, operate on a random number of input data, and then it's generating a unique uh, fixed size uh, data, which is most of the time shorter than, than the, the input data. So for example, you have SHA-2, SHA-1, MD5, and um, you have a lot more. So th the main uh, things that we want from a Nash algorithm is that uh, we want the probability to uh, have two exact same hashes from two different inputs uh, to be as low as possible. And ideally, we'd, we'd like this to be neural, but that's almost impossible. Uh, we also wanted to uh, make it impossible for, for a user to regenerate the input data from the hash. And the last thing we want is that if we do a tiny modification in, in the input stream, we want the output uh, hash, uh, the hash result to be uh, as far as possible from uh, the initial uh, hash. Um, the next thing we need when we're doing uh, cryptography is the uh, cipher element. So cipher is supposed to ensure uh, confidentiality, and it's basically using a, a private key or a, a key to encrypt and decrypt data. So um, you can have two types of uh, ciphers. The trim cipher, which, which kind of operates on uh, a random number of uh, data, and the block ciphers, which are uh, meant to be used on the fixed size blocks. 
Um, then you also have the notion of uh, symmetry and asymmetry. So symmetric ciphers are uh, supposed to use the same key for both decryption and encryption, which means all the people which want to take part to communication have to share the exact same private key. And of course, that's not really secure because if one of these people uh, get this key group, um, uh, stolen, then that means the, the whole communication is, is uh, uh, insecure. So to, to address that, we also have asymmetric ciphers, which are using a pair of uh, public and private keys. So the private key is kept secret and only the creator of the key keeps it. Then it can, also, it can send the public key to anyone who wants to communicate this with this person. And all the messages are actually uh, encrypted with using the public key, and only the owner of the private key can decrypt the messages. So we tend to use asymmetric ciphers for, uh, to enforce security when we don't know exactly who we will communicate with uh, afterwards. But it's also a lot more expensive than uh, symmetric ciphers. So it's kind of a compromise here. Uh, a few examples, so uh, for symmetric ciphers, we have AES, and for asymmetric ciphers, we have, for example, uh, RSA. Um, so I said that uh, we have uh, stream ciphers and block ciphers, and even when, you, you, when we use block ciphers, most of the time we want to uh, be able to uh, use those block ciphers for a random number of blocks. And in order to do that in a secure way, we, we will have to uh, choose a specific block cipher mode. And the block cipher mode is just um, something that describes how you can uh, decrypt uh, or encrypt several uh, blocks of data. So, um, for example, you have the ECB uh, block, mod, block cipher mode, which is pretty simple. It just takes a key, some input data, and then does some operation on it. and uh, and provide the output data which has been uh, encrypted with the key. And you have more advanced uh, cipher uh, mode, which are uh, getting the result of the previous uh, encryption and using that as an initialization vector to encrypt the next block, which ensure that the data you are transmitted are actually uh, obfuscated. So you cannot uh, guess exactly what, what has been transmitted by observing the, the communication. Another thing we have in cryptography is uh, what we call MAC, which stands for uh, Message Authentication Codes. Um, this is actually used to, um, to authenticate the, uh, who actually sent the, the, the message. So what it does is it takes a private key then it does some transformation on, on the, um, the input data and generates some uh, output data which are put next to the, the, the data so that the, the receiver can then verify that uh, the sender actually uh, is the one who, who claims it, it is. Um, so most of the time the, the MAC algorithm are based on hash algorithm and that's why we call them hash MAC. And then we have the uh, advanced block we use in cryptography, which is doing all of the things we've seen so far in a single step. So this means that these kind of algorithms are taking some data, uh, generating uh, data to uh, ensure data integrity, to ensure confidenti confidentiality, and to ensure authentication. And most of the time, those are actually based on simpler blocks like HMAC, uh, CBC, and, and, and so on. So this was really a short introduction to, to the, those crypto concepts. If you want to know more about these the things I, I am talking about here, uh, you should watch the talk from uh, Gilad Ben Youssef. And I think he's giving a talk this week. So if you want to go see his, his presentation, I think it's, it's a good one. Um, then I'm switched to what we uh, really, what we are really interested in here, uh, the Linux crypto framework. 
So um, let's see a bit how it works internally before seeing how to use it and how to develop a driver. So internally, everything in the crypto framework is about transforming data in order to generate something else. And that's why you'll see a lot of places where we are talking about transformation. So there are two main objects. We have the transformation uh, implementation, which is uh, the um, base class, which is supposed to uh, implement a specific algorithm. And then you have transformation objects, which are uh, the instance uh, that are uh, provided by a specific transformation implementation when someone asks uh, to create such an instance. So if I had to make an analogy with uh, an object-oriented language, I'd say that the tr transformation implementation is actually a factory and which is able to generate a uh, transformation object. And then these are the objects the crypto user will uh, use to do all kind of transformation. So everything in the crypto framework actually inherits from those two uh, interfaces, crypto alg and crypto TFM. Um, the crypto framework supports a bunch of algorithm. So you have a lot of ciphers, algorithm, hash algorithm, uh, AED algorithm, HMAC, and you also have one, I don't know exactly why, why it's here, but you also have a compression algorithm, which have nothing to do with uh, crypto at all, but I think it was fitting well in, in the crypto framework, and this is why they decided to implement it there. So these are the base uh, class of, of, of um, crypto objects. And then, uh, based on that, you will be able to uh, generate complex objects which are combining different elements. So for example, you will be able to uh, generate a Nash Mac function which is using internally the uh, SHA-1 pro protocol. Or you will be able to use the IS, uh, AES block cipher uh, using uh, in, in uh, CBC mode. Or you will even be able to create an AEAD algorithm based on HMAC, SHA1, and CBC AES. So as you can see, we always start from simple blocks and then build something more complicated from, from there. So how can you use the, the crypto framework? The first thing you'll start to do when you want to do some crypto operation is uh, allocate an algorithm instance, what we call the uh, TFM object. So this is done with a call to crypto alloc, and then you pass the uh, alloc type suffix. So you have SK cipher for symmetry K cipher, uh, AH alloc for uh, Ash algorithm and, and so on. To this function, it will pass the algorithm names. We will see later what should be passed here. Then you will pass a type. I'm still not sure what this type is about because uh, obviously the type is already known in the uh, function prefix, but still you have a type parameter. And then you have a mask which is saying the crypto engine what kind of implementation you want to avoid. So for example, you want to avo avoid uh, implementation which are uh, doing things uh, asynchronously because you want, when you trigger a crypto operation, you want the result to be available when the function returns. And then that's the kind of thing you will be able to uh, ask when you uh, instantiate the, the TFM object. Once you have this TFM object, you will be able to uh, create crypto requests and this is done with the uh, request alloc functions. So again, always prefixed with the alloc type. Uh, and with this um, request object, you will be able to uh, assign a specific callback, callback that will be called every time a crypto operation is complete. You will be able to pass a few flags, for example, whether you allow the uh, crypto framework to uh, queue the, re the request to the backlog if there are already too many requests inside the crypto queue and, and, and other things like that. So that's for the init part of the, uh, the creation. 
Once you have that, you want to you will want to set the context of your uh, transformation object. And most of the time, the context is about setting the private key or the public key or whatever you want to use to uh, do this crypto operation. So here you'll, you'll use the crypto alc alc type set and the context you want to set. So f most of the time it's crypto something set key. Um, <coughs> once you have set up everything, you can start passing data to the, the crypto uh, instance. So to do that, you will uh, use the request set crypt, which you will pass the input buffer, the output buffer, and the length of the buffer. And you will be able to trigger the crypto operation. So this time, it will be done using crypto, then alc type, then the name of the operation. So for example, for a cipher, it will be encrypt or decrypt. And you can do that many times, as many times as you want. Say that you have several uh, blocks of data to encrypt, then you can repeat that over and over until you're done with encrypting or decrypting data. And once you're done, you can then free uh, the both the request and the crypto engine context. So that's how it's done. So let's see a real example of code to see how it interacts with uh, the rest. Um, yeah, the code I'm, I'm going to show here is not really uh, to be used in, in real uh, setup. So this is just to show all the different steps you have to, to, to do, but that you shouldn't base your development on that if you really need to, to, to develop uh, something that uses uh, the crypto API. So let's look at the right of the screen. And we're looking at the encrypt function, which is the main entry point. So this function is supposed to encrypt some uh, some data. You will be you will pass it the, the key, the private key you want to use. You will pass it the, the data you want to encrypt. So this is this serves both of the uh, input buffer and output buffer. And you will uh, pass the size. The first thing you'll have to do is uh, allocate. Uh, the crypto uh, context, then uh, set up the request, and, and and so on. So we'll call the init function, which is doing, uh, which is calling the crypto alloc SK cipher, so allocating uh, symmetry key cipher algorithm. We then uh, use the request alloc to create a new request. Then we specify the callback we want to be called when the um, when the operation is complete. And finally, we uh, initialize a completion element. Once we are done with that, we set up the key. So uh, we use the crypto SK cipher set key. And we set up also the, the data to pass to the, the crypto API. So we uh, have to pass it using an SG uh, element, a scatter gather list. And then we just call request set crypt to say that this is me, my input buffer, this is my output buffer, and this is the length of the buffer. And once this is done, you just trigger the, the crypto request, you calling crypto SK cipher encrypt. So by design, the uh, crypto API is uh, asynchronous, which means when this function returns, you are not guaranteed that the operation is actually done. And this is why the, the crypto API can return in progress or busy errors. And in this case, you shouldn't consider that as uh, a real error. You should just uh, wait for the uh, actual operation to be, to be done. And this is simply done by our calling wait for completion on, on the completion object you have initialized in the init function. So once this is done, you uh, get back the uh, error, clean up everything, and then return the return code. So this is a simple example of the different steps you'll have to follow to use the crypto API inside the kernel. Of course, this was just a dummy example. If you uh, want to look at real example, you just have to grab for crypto lock something, and you should find 
uh, different elements which are using crypto. For example, we, we have dmcrypt, which is doing encryption. We have uh, various network protocols which are using crypto, file systems, device drivers, and I guess you can find more. So really, the, the crypto uh, API is used all over the, the kernel. Um, now we have a specific user. Some people want to use the crypto engines from user space. And so um, they pushed for a long time to have something uh, inside the kernel to expose those crypto features to, to user space. So we have currently two uh, competing solutions. The crypto dev uh, approach, which is not mainline, so that's not so good. And we have the AF alg, which is uh, mainline. So let's see a bit how uh, both solution compares. The first solution to have emerged is uh, crypto dev, and it's actually uh, taken from the open BSD word. And this solution is actually exposing a device under slash dev. And every time you want to do something from user space, you just use IOCTOLs to set up the context, then send data, and, and so on. And the main problem with this solution is that it's maintained as, as an out of three modules, uh, and as an out of three module, and will never be a mainline. Simply because we have something in mainline which indels, um, um, which exposes uh, crypto features to the user space, and this is called AFALG. Um, <coughs> instead of exposing things to, uh, through uh, a, a dev slash dev slash something device, uh, it's exposing things through a Netflix socket. And the main problem with AFALG is that most user space crypto library are not using it. For example, OpenSSL has an out of three module for AFL, which is poorly maintained. But in the other end, on the other end, it has native support for uh, crypto dev. So you'll have to make a choice whether you want to uh, add an out of three module inside the kernel, or whether you want to uh, add support for uh, AFL uh, into OpenSSL compiling an out of three uh, library. So before, um, actually, I, I, I didn't try to understand how they, they work internally. But I tried to um, see how they differ, uh, wha what kind of performances they, they can provide, both of, both of them can provide. And there was an, an assumption that, or at least it is written everywhere on the internet, that uh, crypto dev is uh, performing better than AFL. So I wanted to make sure that with my crypto engine, the uh, Marvel one, this was the case. And actually, it's the case. For uh, 8K blocks on an AES CPC algorithm, then you see that the crypto dev algorithm is performing better. But you also see that for really small blocks, it's almost useless to use the uh, internal implementation compared to the to the uh, user space implementation. And then I decided to test the uh, user space implementation, which is probably using uh, the processor optimizations or I, uh, assembly instructions. But still, it's worth looking at, at the results. So as you can see, even CryptoDev is outperformed that by, by the, the software implementation. So I decided to run the same test and launch a few uh, threads in parallel because my engine is able to do things at the DMA level. And the more I have requests, the better it, it reacts, it, it scales. And actually, I had to uh, create 228 threads to get better results with uh, the internal implementation. And Interestingly, it was achieved with the AFL implementation and not with the crypto dev implementation. But still, when you are asking yourself whether you should use crypto dev or AFL, actually, the first thing you should ask yourself is whether you want to use any of them. Because when you compare the results to the uh, pure software implementation, 
then it's not so good. And I also had a look at the CPU and consumption because every time you use a, a no, uh, an external engine, the one of the things you want is that uh, you don't want to you want to offload the CPU. And actually, even the uh, the version using the uh, hardware engine is using quite a lot of CPU. So it's using around 60% of the CPU compared to 100% when you use the pure software implementation. So really, I don't think in most cases it makes sense to use uh, your ad hardware engine from user space. The only case where it might be interesting is when you have a lot of um, requests which are coming in parallel. But other than that, you should think twice be tr before uh, trying to use those hardware engines from, from user space. So now let's have a look at um, <coughs> uh, how to develop a crypto engine driver. So from the uh, crypto API point of view, a crypto engine is just a cr um, an, implementation, uh, an implementation of a specific algorithm. And the crypto uh, API does not distinguish between uh, pure software implementation and those which are using dedicated engines. So de developing a crypto engine driver is just about uh, implementing uh, and registering a crypto alg uh, interface. So most of the time you don't implement crypto alg directly, you implement something that inherits from crypto alg because as I said, crypto alg is the base class, the base interface, and then you have to inherit from it. Uh, so you implement it, you register it using a crypto register something and the something is the type of crypto algorithm. And so we will see uh, a simple example with a CBC AES driver. We studied this one because it's quite simple. Now if you want to have a look at our hash algorithm or uh, advanced AEAD algorithm, then I recommend that you look at existing drivers to see how it's implemented. So the first thing you have to uh, do when you uh, implement a crypto algorithm or uh, crypto engine uh, support, the first thing you'll have to do is uh, fill in the uh, crypto alg structure. So the first name, the first field you'll have to uh, uh, pass is the uh, crypto algorithm name. So this one is uh, standardized and you always have to use uh, the real name of the algorithm. So for example, this is CBC based on e e AES, so this is the name you'll have to pass. Then you will pass the driver name, so this time you don't use parentheses, you, you just use dash, and then you prefix it with the driver name. So XXX is just the name of the driver. The next field you'll have to, to specify is the priority. Uh, the priority is supposed to be um, representing how well the, the engine is behaving compared to other implementation. Um, so basically by convention we have this rule which is hardware engines always have higher pri priority than uh, arch optimized uh, implementation which have higher priorities than plain C. So normally we have hardware engines which have a priority of 300. Then you pass some flags which are specifying which kind of algorithm you are implementing and the, the different things the uh, uh, algorithm supports. So for example, if your algorithm is uh, behaving, is, is, is doing things asynchronously, then you have to pass the crypto alg async. Uh, or uh, if the um, crypto engine is not directly accessible to user space, you'll have to pass the uh, crypto alg current driver only, which allows the system to know when it, choose ex when it should expose the, the algorithm to the uh, user space interface. The next thing you'll have to do for the uh, for, uh, block algorithm is to specify the block size which this algorithm is operating on. Then you'll have the context which is representing your uh, driver specific context. 
So every time you have a new instance, you will have a new context allocated, and this context is actually allocated by the crypto, uh, crypto framework. So the crypto, crypto framework needs to know how much data you need for your own private data. And this is why you have to uh, specify the context size. And the last thing you'll have to specify is uh, the descriptor and uh, constructor methods, which are called every time a new instance is created or destroyed. So let's uh, have a look at the, the part of the crypto algorithm which is uh, specific. So here the SK cipher algorithm is inheriting from the crypto alg, and you'll have to implement a few fields in this uh, SK cipher alg. So the first one we'll have to implement is the set key, because this is a uh, cipher algorithm. Then you have to implement uh, two methods, encrypt and decrypt. And then some information about the, the key size and the IV size if the algorithm needs an IV. Then inside your function, you just do what has to be done to encrypt, decrypt, or uh, assign the key to, to the context. So all those functions have to be uh, driver specific because each engine is handling things differently. And once you have done that, you just call uh, the crypto register or something, and that's all you should be done. And your driver should, your uh, crypto engine should be exposed. So when the framework exposes the crypto engine, and someone wants to use this crypto engine, it will either uh, you ask the, the crypto uh, API to allocate uh, an instance based on the uh, usual uh, algorithm name, so here CBC AES, and depending on all the engines which are registered to the system and based on the priority, then the crypto API will decide which one you should use. The higher priority, uh, the, the, the engine with the higher priority will be chosen over the other. If you want to really use one specific engine because you know uh, this is the one you want to use, then you can also pass directly the uh, driver name when you request a crypto instance. But usually, most of the time, the users don't want to uh, have to specify a specific engine. They just pass the algorithm name. So that's all I have on the... Uh, crypto uh, framework uh, part. Now I'll, I'd like to share a few things that have been compli complicated to deal with during the, the development of the driver. So first, um, the framework is really complex. And actually it's complex for a good reason. When you look at the number of algorithms which are supported in there and the, the, um, how easy it is to, to add a new algorithm to the to the framework, then it explains why it, it become it became so 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 complex. And also one of the good things is that even though it, it's really complex, you uh, have an extensive test suite. So every time you add a driver for a crypto engine, then you can run the test suite and and um, and make sure that your the, your driver is is actually. Uh, behaving correctly. Well, the bad aspect is that uh, it's so open that most of the time you have s several ways to do the same thing. And one example is, for example, how you can implement a crypto engine for an SK cipher uh, algorithm. And you actually have two ways right now. So I think SK cipher is the, the right way to do it, but we still have drivers uh, which have not been converted converted yet. Also, uh, how to generate from a base class is not really clear. You have at least two ways to generate from it. You some sometime you uh, there is a union inside the base class with uh, different uh, inside the union you have the different interfaces and sometimes the, the the child class is uh, embedding directly the base class. So it's not clear what kind of uh, inheritance you want to, to do here. Also, it's hard to tell uh, what are the good practices because when the framework evolves, then the new drivers are switching to the new method, but the old drivers are usually staying uh, like they were. 
And the last thing is that uh, there are some aspects that can be discovered the hard way. For example, I didn't know at the beginning that the uh, complete codeback had, has to, had to be called with the soft IRQs disabled, which is actually logic because most uh, one of the big users of the crypto API is the network stack, and in the network stack, ev almost everything is done in a soft IRQ context when it comes to uh, handling packets. So it needs, when you do a crypto operation, it needs to be done in the soft IRQ context. But well, this is not the only subsystem where it's not completely consistent. And I'm probably not the good person to complain about that because in the non-framework it's even worse. Um, <coughs> and that's not something we can address easily. So it requires cooperation from both the maintainer and, and all the driver developers and, and maintainers. So it, it takes a lot of time to migrate all, all drivers to new methods to do things. Another problem I had when uh, developing the driver and, and testing it is that uh, there is no way to use polling when you are under heavy load, under heavy crypto load, which means uh, even though you have NAPI activated at the net level, which allows the network stack to uh, do things in the thread context and, and, and pull for the um, and and yeah, do that to all the packet handling in, in, in a thread context. Then you will have the uh, crypto API, which will generate a lot of interrupts, which kind of defeat the whole purpose of uh, NAPI. So in this CSR driver, we address that manually by creating a thread IRQ and then doing a bit of polling after uh, the last crypto request has been done to see if the next one can be handled after that. But still, it, it's a bit hacky. And I wonder if we shouldn't find a better solution, like maybe add something to support NAPI-like interface in, in the crypto API. So I'm not sure about that. It's really a question to, to the audience. And the last one, the last point we we f uh, we, fi we fought with um, was um, the load balancing issue. So in uh, Marvel SOCs, you usually usually have two uh, two crypto engines, which are exactly the same, and based uh, using the uh, priority based selection of the engine, uh, you cannot use the second one. So every time this is the first one which is chosen to to do things. Also, if you say you have in the same system different crypto engines with uh, which are not exactly the same but still can be used in parallel, then actually only one of them will uh, be able to end the request because only the one with the highest priority will be chosen when something needs to be done. So the question is, should we introduce some kind of uh, load balancing mechanism? Well, it's not so simple to do because the framework is not designed to do that uh, uh, from the from the beginning. So, if we need to do that, we need to introduce a new concept, which is a crypto engine concept, and each crypto engine is able to expose different algorithms. We also need to uh, find a way to assign a load to each request because each request will be queued to a specific engine. So we can either uh, find a way to uh, calculate something which is rather complicated based on the request type, the request length, and the engine it, it is queued to, or we can just do something as simple as the load equal the length of the request. And of course, we need to keep track of uh, the total load of each crypto engine. And the last thing we need to handle is how to migrate uh, requests from one engine to another. Because every time you want to switch to a different engine, you need to uh, allocate a new context, which is driver specific, and then allocate a new request, which is also driver specific. So this is just 
an idea how it would uh, look like, but really there is no proof of concept or nothing like that. But I think we can keep the upper layer unchanged, meaning that uh, the crypto alley user could still uh, request the crypto API to allocate a specific uh, a specific instance based on the priority. And then below that, we could add some the notion of load balancer, which you would uh, gather all crypto engines which implement a specific algorithm, and then at the load balancer level decide which one should be used depending on the current load on each engine. So yeah, that's some ideas. So that's all I have about uh, the crypto API and and the Linux stuff. Yeah. So do you have any question or suggestion or comments? Okay, so you want to access the, uh, the cushion is, well it's, it's a command, you want to directly access the hardware engine directly from user space. So you're not using Linux. Yeah, actually it, it, it should give good performances compared to the numbers I gave here. Because it's comple completely bypassing all the, the kind of stuff and, and all the overhead you can have when you're switching to, to user mode and, and so on. Yeah, actually, I'm not the one you should ask to, but... <laughs> yeah. You should talk to Herbert. Yeah. Yeah, why not? I mean... Mm. So anyway, it would be a asynchronous crypto engine because you, was, you would queue some requests and then wait for the, those requests to to be complete. And so it, I think it will it would it would fit pretty well in the crypto API. I can tell. I think if you are using the uh, FPGA to access to to provide things to the use space, then you would have also poor performances because you still have all the, the stack to, to go through every time you want to do crypto requests, uh, which is where the overhead is. Yep. No, actually, you just have to. Uh, so the question is, uh, what has to be done to uh, enable the crypto manager test, self-test? Actually, it's just an option to uh, enable. By default, all the tests are disabled. You just enable an option and it's done. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, did I consider the um, poor consumption when doing my test? And the, the answer is no. And actually the comment is that uh, some engines are uh, consuming less than the CPU, so even if the CPU is a bit more loaded in the end, it would be interesting to use the crypto engine. Is that right? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I, I, had, I would have to do more tests to, to test that. Okay, I think we the the whole crypto API is based on, on SG scatter list, so it's sort of it should already be ready for uh, DMA. I think what you want is to have everything contiguously allocated. So I don't know if there's a solution to allocate uh, the crypto request in in the contiguous.
actually this is, this is the crypto user which is allocating the data to be encrypted or decrypted or whatever. Yeah, so you want to have an interface to ask the driver to allocate the data? Okay. I don't know if it's planned, but yeah, that, that would be a, a solution. If you want to use a pre-allocated pool in order to have uh, things in a specific area of the, the, the memory. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I didn't mention that. It's uh, Cortex A9 for cores. So basically, when you have this test, it's only using one core. Uh, this one, sorry. It's only using one core. And when you have the uh, 128 threads, it's using the four cores to do the operation. But still, it's, it's still performing better than the uh, hardware engine. There is a fine slash proc something. I have no answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't hear you. Um, actually, the OpenSSL tests are only doing tests on maximum 8 kilobytes. So I didn't test on more than 8 kilobytes. But I think it's since the engine is acting on, on 2K blocks, shouldn't change that much in, in our case. Sorry, I don't hear you. Can you come closer? <laughs> yeah? We could, we could do that. Uh, yeah, it should. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. How does? Yeah. Um, it's, it's an algorithm which is uh, arch optimized. So it's using assembly specific instructions. So it's Basically, implementing using an uh, SK software alg, which is relying on specific instructions. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. So yeah, uh, everything, every uh, implementation which are ar arc optimized are also exposed as uh, crypto alg. That's that's using the same interface. Yeah. Maybe the last one. Okay.
Yeah, I think there is a way to uh, do zero copy. I, I didn't uh, dig into it. Okay. But not the other way. Okay. Mm, I don't know. You should ask uh, the uh, crypto maintainer for that. Sorry. Thanks.